Liu. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Programs in our Office for International Studies and Programs. And uh, welcoming you to today's Global Engagement Speaker Series. It's my pleasure to welcome you, but also in a few minutes introduce today's speaker. The Global Engagement Speaker Series is sponsored by the Office of International Studies and Programs, University Outreach and Engagement, as well as the Graduate School, and invites individuals of distinction from higher education, global organizations, and philanthropies to share their thoughts, research, practice uh, with the MSU community. Advancing understanding and dialogue about fundamental human rights and meeting basic human needs is at the core of the series, and speakers highlight the role of higher education as a collaborator working with civil societies, governments, and industry to enhance societal well-being. In addition to those of us participating here on campus, presentations in the series are live streamed to an audience around the world. Those can be accessed via the series YouTube channel. I invite online viewers to submit questions or comments they may have for our speaker through the live chat feature that accompanies the live stream, and we will uh, share those submissions during the question and answer portion of the presentation. It's now my uh, pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Norbert Steinhaus. Mr. Steinhaus, who holds a master's degree in education, uh, I'm sorry, agriculture from Bonn University, joined the Bonn Science Shop in 1988 and became a board member in 1990. I think as many of you know, science shops are small organizations that carry out scientific research in a wide range of disciplines on behalf of citizens and local civil society. This work is usually free of charge and responsive to civil society's needs for expertise and knowledge, a key element that distinguishes science shops from other knowledge transfer mechanisms. The shops provide independent participatory research support in response to concerns experienced by civil society. Founded in 1984, the Bond Science Shop has been active for more than 30 years and has become one of the largest science shops in the world. It focuses on key societal challenges in areas such as land use, changing labor markets, energy transition, sustainable work fields, and social uh, justice, to name just a few. In his work, Mr. Steinhaus has cooperated in many international projects on topics including training and mentoring of science shops, citizen participation in science and technology, public engagement with research, and research engagement with society. He has also created schools and kindergartens as well as SUF learning, uh, staff of small and medium enterprises. Today, Mr. Steinhaus is the coordinator and international point of contact of the broad-based Living Knowledge, the International Science Shop Network, a position he has held since 2007. Since I know you're here to hear from him and not me, I will point you to our full bio. Uh, which you can access out front that has additional details on his background. So without further ado, I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming Mr. Steinhaus. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. I'm delighted, I'm honored to be invited to talk to you this afternoon, so m many thanks uh, to, the, uh, to the University and Outreach and Engagement uh, Unit here at the University and all others who are involved uh, to, um, to, to get me here. Uh, I'm, I'm really um, delighted that um, about the interest in the science shop methodology, and uh, so maybe I can get a bit more into details when uh, we're moving on. And please, I do not want to stand here and talk all the time. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a challenge. It's, it's not impolite if you interrupt me and ask me any question at a certain point. 
of, of my presentation here. So um, it allows me to be a bit, speak a bit more freely uh, instead of following my script, which is obviously quite, <laughs> quite thick. Um, as, as you said, um, I don't have to introduce myself now because uh, thank you for, for giving this overview of my, my uh, activities. And uh, maybe let's start. It's, it's a challenging title given democratizing knowledge, science jobs, knowledge mobilization, and broader impacts. A uh, lot of terms in this title, of which each allows, of course, for a series of, of lectures, talks, workshops, um, and we do not have much more than just one hour here. But let, let me start with democracy. James Boward once said, uh, democracy is when four wolves and one sheep decide what to have for lunch. <laughs> this, this, is, this is a nice picture when you think of, the, of, of stakeholders being involved in, a, in, in an uh, engagement process, in a research process. So who are the stakeholders? Research, education, policy, industry, and civil society. So who of them are the wolves? Who's the sheep? Uh, I, I think we have to talk about civil society as a sheep a bit later on. So second question, of course, in the title, what is knowledge? And um, when you look into a dictionary, the Oxford Dictionary, uh, it writes, facts, information, and skills acquired through experience or education, a theoretical or practical understanding of a subject. So we're going a bit through, through um, definitions at so knowledge is knowing about something. It's a general understanding. It's a state of having been informed. It's a state of appreciating truth or information. Um, and if you look into this definition, this doesn't say anything about academics being the sole source of knowledge. You know, it's not the focus on academics. It's not focusing on passing knowledge downstream uh, to various communities who then have to absorb uh, and put into use what is produced in the academic environment. So when, when we talk about knowledge, shouldn't we more focus on knowledge processes, on collaborative knowledge processes, uh, and active, actively involve diverse knowledge systems, individual local knowledge, collective cultural knowledge, example, the indigenous uh, people's understanding of natural resource management approaches, political knowledge, and of course, finally, uh, and not at the last position, the scientific or expert knowledge. Um, so maybe we have to speak about knowledges instead of just knowledge. Uh, and of course, we cannot give knowledge a Western, a European, a global North focus uh, or centric vision talking about uh, appreciating or involving it. Uh, involving different knowledges in a knowledge production process is challenging, but each source contributes to a broader understanding of a problem domain. Uh, and uh, it's, <laughs> it's uh, obvious that the sum of the single production element is bigger uh, than the single uh, the, the sum of the parts. So when we talk about the democratization of knowledge, uh, what does it address, the wolves or the sheep? In my understanding, democratization of knowledge is building communities, it's developing literacies, it's eliminating barriers, it's granting access to information, and it's seeding change on eye level with all stakeholders, with all wolves and sheep. And there's another term in the title which says knowledge mobilization. Um, we will leave these broader terms <laughs> quite quickly and get to the science jobs. But um, I think you're aware of SHARC, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Uh, they, SHARC, yeah. <laughs> Did I pronounce it wrong? No. Sure. OK, SHARC. SHARC. OK, thank you. <laughs> No, they, they see knowledge mobilization as an umbrella term um, for a wide range of activi activities relating to the production and the use of research results, uh, which include uh, dissemination, transfer, 
exchange and the co-creation and co-production co by researchers and knowledge users. And if you look into Wikipedia, um, it's a proactive process that involves specific efforts to build relationships between research producers and users, events, networks, uh, and different other activities. So it's a broad concept. It encompasses a variety of strategies. It can be seen as a user pull, a producer push activity where researchers do the work and trying to share the knowledge. But it's also can seen as a user pull where research users seek information, uh, knowledge exchange and co-production of knowledge. So it's all about the creating value from different knowledges. And we have a variety of strategies in the, in the, in, under the aspect of user pool and co-production. I mentioned them here, action research, community-based research, participatory action research, responsible research and innovation, which probably is a term mainly used in, in Europe and less known uh, over here. Talking about citizen science, we have the sign shop. There are a lot of, lot of definitions available for these. I just want to mention community-based research um, because it was developed at the same time sign shops came up in Europe. So community-based research is more or less something uh, based in, uh, in North America. And again, a definition, I'm sorry for that. It's a research activity performed by public or private, commercial or non-commercial institutions in response to community needs. And um, you have already mentioned the definition of sign shops. There's a lot of similarity in this. And uh, that's uh, probably leads to a better understanding of what sign shops do and that there's not such a big difference in activities all around the world. We just found another brand name for what we do. And if you come up with a new brand name, it's possibly easier to get some kind of uh, support for the activity. So let's, let's get a bit into details about sign shops. Um, when talking about sign shops, it, it might be helpful to divide um, the perspective on sign shops, either to see them as an organizational structure or um, discuss them under the aspect of a met methodology. Uh, when you think of a sign shop as a structure, and I will go into details later on a bit, allows for an implementation of uh, various engagement methodologies and um, instead of just one single. The dis definition you have already read, you can read it down there. A sign shop is a facility, is a unit for society science relations, uh, a unit that provides independent participatory research support in response to concerns expressed and experienced by civil society. And maybe this is another difference and has to be explained when we talk about science. So we understand science in its broadest sense. So maybe this is the difference between English and uh, other uh, European languages. Um, it's not just natural sciences. It's not just hard sciences when we talk about science. It's, it's science including uh, uh, social sciences, including engineering, um, including all kinds of technical sciences, health, and medicine. When you have a sign shop as an organizational structure, but also in the processes when working with the sign shop methodology, the, the, the core element is the mediation between uh, citizens and citizen groups and research institutions. And they are just one way to transfer knowledge in an innovative and effective way. Just one way. There are many, many others, and I already have learned here about many others how it can be done when you talk about citizen engagement and community engagement. In these days, sign shops, many of them, not all of them, have structural links to universities and work together with students, or maybe say use students, um, under appropriate supervision to respond to civil society needs. But there are general criteria um, for accepting a request 
as a sign shop activity, as a sign shop cooperation with civil society. So the request addressed to a sign shop must have a scientific element in the question. This is, uh, of course, otherwise you cannot transfer it into the research system. The problem needs to have a, a general public interest or the question must be relevant to a larger number of people. So it's not just the individual who comes and asks, there must be a broader interest behind it. The results produced through the research uh, activity must be usable uh, for the organization asking for support. And one really important aspect is the results will be published. Um, yeah, so because, you know, universities are funded with public money, the research is done at low costs or no costs for the civil society organization or the community group, and therefore uh, the, the, there is a need for publication of the respective results. And one other element, and probably this will be in discussion, under discussion in, in the near future, there should be no commercial interest uh, in the in the research to be done. Um, again, public money for, for, for the work to be performed, and um, so therefore why developing something professional or um, for, for, um, for, for income with public money. So when we talk about the science of methodology, um, what, what kind of what kind of needs can be expressed by, by the civil society organization? It might be a scientific analysis of a problem. Um, the need for knowledge can also be for an enhancement of, uh, of knowledge around a certain topic, um, the development of solutions, or an evaluate, eval evaluation of the different activities of a community service of a community project. So um, when, when you think about uh, the methodology, how to be applied um, in, in, or implemented um, in, in the university or research context, we have three different levels. So the broadest level, the first level is, uh, describes minimum activities. Um, it's a short period activity after receiving a request or a question, together with the client, the problem will be artic articulated. So there will be a mapping of the problem. So what is, what is the question behind the problem? So what, what refers to the problem? Is it, uh, do we really understand it right? Is it expressed in a, in a way that it can be transferred to another unit? The second uh, activity in this level is a preliminary research. Are there already results available uh, on, on this question? Then, of course, there's no need for further, for further research. Um, but if, um, if there, is there any societal relevance in the, in, in the problem expressed? So this might lead to a refusal for different reasons, no, no bigger societal interest, or it's already there. So the people uh, who were asking get an advice please check this, this information uh, resource. Uh, this is a reference. Maybe a short advice how to move on with this problem. Or if it's accepted, it will be transferred uh, and uptaken up as a scientific research question. So this, this, is, this is the first step. When it's, oh, sorry. When it's accepted as, um, as a research question, then together with uh, the partners, with local experts and the local community, ex um, community of practice, this research question will be forwarded into the research system at the university. And then, it, of course, it depends on the, on the size of the problem, on the size of the question, if it will be or can be answered by, by a student, an undergraduate student in a semester project or a six week of, of uh, working time, or if it will be a broader, broader um, research necessary. The co-researcher, a supervisor, or a suitable course within the university setting has to be identified. 
and um, of course the student has to be found to work on it. You see already in this construction there are a lot of, lot of pitfalls. <laughs> yeah? So does it fit into the academic year when the question comes up? <laughs> are there students? Uh, how can <laughs> who want to take up the question? Um, uh, is there a supervisor who has interest in the research field who can co really contribute to it? So there's, there's a, lot of to a lot of things to negotiate uh, be before it comes to really um, uh, work on, on the expressed uh, request. And of course, during this pr uh, period, during the research period, the communication and um, will be maintained with support by the sign shop staff and uh, the process will be you know, some, somehow accompanied to make sure that all the developments are in line with the requests of uh, the community group. And in the end, the sign shop supports the usable presentation of the result. Might be a report, might be a presentation at a conference, uh, a press release, a seminar, a website, or whatever is appropriate for the partners involved in this activity. Yes, please. Yes, yes, sure. So the general idea is to forward it to students. Uh, for some reasons I will explain later in, in the impact chapter. <laughs> um, Yes, so this, this is the first starting point. And this, of course, has um, requests a bit of working on the question. If the question is quite big, it might be broken down in a couple of smaller questions so that you can forward it to a seminar that a couple of students can take them and work in a, se in a seminar or in a course environment. Um, of course, when it's a bigger question, and it might, it might make sense to give it into, uh, to forward it into a master thesis, um, or even in a PhD thesis. But from, from examples um, I might give, it, it moves, it can move from, from a first request in a semester analysis uh, to a PhD and a publication which definitely ends up in a, in a larger uptake of the, of the information of the results even in governmental programs. Yeah, so it, it, it depends on a bit on how the client how much time the client has. So of course, if, if you have a question and you have to wait for the result of a PhD, so this might <laughs> probably not really, really fit <laughs> and, and connect to the, to, to the needs of, of the civil society organization of the community group. And if we go into the, in the top of the pyramid, into, into the third level, um, I would say it's not really to be, can, cannot really be expected that a sign shop uh, gets in here and does that, it's not part of the research period, but a side shop, especially when we think of a side shop as an organizational structure, might help implement the re research results um, and support thinking about follow-up actions based on the results which came out of the research. So applying the methodology aims at encouraging citizens to actively participate in research processes by formulating research requests. It has to do with skills uh, a bit, and of course it has to do with skills on both sides. We're talking about language here. So citizens, community groups speak a certain language which has to be translated into a scientific language or a language a, a researcher, a scientist can understand. Usually we think the other way around. So we have scientific results and we have to translate it into, in a way that community groups can understand what we have produced. But it's both ways. It's a dialogue, it's a two-way dialogue, it's a two-way translation that has, be, has to be done here. But community groups by this can learn and understand that they can inspire science and research through their real life needs, expectations, and ideas. Um, yeah. <laughs> Any questions while I turn the pages? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> so, um, 
It should be, yes, of, of course, because when, when you just come up with a, with a question, um, let me say, there's a, there's a community group or a, a residence besides a factory. The factory has a large chimney, yellow smoke is coming off out of the chimney, and the um, residents say, I'm afraid of getting cancer. So that's the problem, but this is not a research question. So in a, in a back and forth with, um, with the people living there, together with the factory and together with the researcher, you can break it down, for example, to a, to a series of emissions. Yeah, so that company uh, running the factory can even contribute by you know, describing the production service, what was, is produced at what time, so that an emission series can really be tailored to what the concerns of the citizens are about, so that you can, up, can, up, can come up with results a student can do these, these measurements and an um, interpretation of the results together with the clients and then you figure out is it what, what they wanted. But just coming up from the question is um, probably just taking it and forwarding it, that's, that's not uh, the, the, the point. You have definitely to, to talk to them to find the question behind the problem. Another example, um, there are elderly people who need support to get out of bed in the morning. So the nurses come in. And they come in only for a short period. And these people complain that these nurses come and uh, stay less and less time at their place. And they come later and later every morning. So this is a problem. But, you know, but this, is, this is not a research question yet. So by, by starting to discuss with them, and this is an exercise we do with uh, summer school students, so what, what could be the problem behind this described uh, issue? So it, it could be the psychological problem because these nurses are the only social contacts these elderly people have during the daytime. Yeah? So they the need for, for discussion and for talk or for exchange. It could be um, a, a traffic problem because there's a construction so the regular route uh, to, to get to the place is disturbed and they have to drive, drive detours, so it's work organization. It might be uh, that there are less nurses for more patients, yeah? so it's a, it's a work organization problem as well. Or it's, it's an uh, engineer, uh, and engineer problem, so if these old people would have the opportunity to lower their bed by themselves so that they might get out of the bed by themselves without which would contribute to their um, say free, free and self-determined uh, living. Yeah, so by talking to them, you, you could identify the real problem behind the question they ask or the question behind the problem, and then you can forward it to the respective faculty and find someone who could contribute to the solution of the problem. Just as a few examples. Another example I wanted to give is from the sign shop of Groningen. It's, it, it was a project um, addressed by the city council of Groningen. There's a, do we do I have a pointer here? Yes. There's a canal, so this should be water. And along the canal was a cycle path. And there was no lighting on the cycle path. But uh, the city wanted to make this safer. But as this this is a natural uh, reserve or natural area. They di didn't want to um, influence not, uh, animals that live in that area. So what could be done? Energy saving, safety, and less influence on the environment. So what, what the, they addressed the sign shop. They had the client who was, able, who was willing to contribute as much as they could. And in this case, uh, they, they thought less impact can be um, researched on the behavior of nocturnal animals when you, when you talk about light during the night. So they were experimenting or they were counting bats uh, and their hunting behavior under different light conditions. And uh, um, the student who was working here examined the impact of regular white lightning, green LED lights, and compared to no lighting. And it was a cooperation between the sign shop who, met, who facilitated the process, a local NGO who had the knowledge about the bats and the bats' behavior, 
the student who analyzed uh, the data that the NGO collected, and the professor who supervised uh, the research activity, the scientific quality of, of the work. So in the end, uh, the result gave a headline in the local newspaper because the green LED light was less effective on these nocturnal animals, so green light for bats. So this is a good example for even a citizen science project because the data collection was done by, an, uh, by a local NGO uh, on a specific concern expressed in this case by a city administration. Another example was um, from um, Queen's University in Belfast where a student worked with a Gaelic football team, a soccer team, um, to examine the role of positive coaching. And the recommendations the student gave um, was used by the organization to develop uh, their coaching strategies to enhance uh, future activities and bring students or bring, bring young football players into the position that they remain with the club and do not leave after a certain time. Yeah, just to, to give you some, some practical things. Now, for something completely different? No, not really. Um, it, it's Bond Sign Shop. My, my organization, the organization I work in for uh, already quite a couple of years. Um, it's established in 1984, as, as said before. It's a non-for-profit organization with different fields of emphasis of activities, like civil society and sustainability, environment and health, labor market, and um, strong focus on the employment market in renewable energies. We have 35 person staff, which has made us the largest sign shop in the world. Um, of course, when, when you think of sign shops based at universities and you have all the research staff and the scientists behind you, of course, then we are a very small unit. <laughs> when you think about, I don't know, 200 researchers supporting the sign shop in one of the Netherlands settings. <laughs> anyway, um, we are not based in the university. We are outside of the university. Uh, again, this, this story, uh, when we started to, to work with the idea of sign shops, which was initiated in, in the Netherlands, uh, and tried to implement that, on, or suggested that to Bonn University, we were seen as, you know, these long hair, left wing students, and this definitely didn't fit into the conservative uh, uh, view the university has. Um, but we thought it was so important to work on these, these connections between society and science that we decided to register as a non-for-profit organization. Now, we cooperate with uh, local universities, now after 35 years of existence. Uh, we cooperate with Bonn University, we cooperate with another university in the region, uh, we cooperate with other uh, universities in Germany, and we have Bonn University on our, on, our, on our advisory board now. So it took a couple of years to be accepted as, uh, as, a, as a valuable and, and sound unit that supports activities which might be for the benefit of universities. Um, so cooperation partners from all kind of organizational types, foundations, um, city administrations, universities, and it depends on the projects we are going to, to run uh, to find the, the, the respective partners here. Funding and finances um, of, of our activities are coming from services we offer, including an um, uh, education center we run but also funds from, for example, the European Commission, uh, federal or state ministries, local authorities, employment agencies. So wherever money is available for a good idea we presented, we try to get hold of it. It needs a lot of creativity. It needs a lot of, not of negotiation. Uh, not all of the projects are based on calls. So we also contact uh, funders directly with, with our ideas for projects. So it's, it's, um, it's a quite successful strategy, but it takes its time, of course. Yeah. Um, 
one thing I want to mention, uh, because I'm quite proud of that, and it was the first time that it happened in Germany in 2016, our organization, Bonn Sign Shop, was awarded as place of progress, and the award was given by the State Ministry for Research and Innovation. Yeah, so we are, that's, that's quite good because it, we were um, not awarded for activities we run in projects, but for our work as a sign shop. We don't get funds as a sign shop, but at least we got the award. <laughs> we cannot buy any bread from it, but um, yeah. The projects I want to introduce now, oh, I'm running, we're definitely running out of time, huh? <laughs> Projects I want to introduce now are more um, problem solving um, and related to the implementation of actions. So they have a different character from those in universities. One, it was a campaign um, to establish um, uh, uh, greening in urban industrial areas. So partners were companies, partners were local community foundations to work on issues of local biodiversity. So it was a campaign that was developed to um, remove covered soil and re-green it by um, I don't know, the different, different kinds, by water, by building uh, natural walls, et cetera, et cetera. So it was about biodiversity conversation in urban areas. It was run in three cities. The project was called Nature into Gray Zones, and um, it um, was the first time that this kind of thinking was placed in areas that have hardly been considered for the implementation of relevant nature protection objectives, because it was in, in company uh, um, in industrial areas. The second project was, um, or the second series of project was developing games, simulation games, role plays, uh, to make young people aware of decision-making processes. So for example, these students or pupils take the role of local politicians uh, to discuss issues of land use. And they take the role of different political parties and discuss within the local parliament, under the headline of the party they represent, the different issues. So, they learned a lot about uh, decision making, and um, it, it, it's an activity running outside of school. So it's not in the school environment. It makes it more attractive, um, and they work with prepared material. So now I have to rush a bit. Don't ask anything. Otherwise. <laughs> so this was nature into gray zones. Yeah. So we brought business and civil society and team actions together. Sign shops, as I said, are not uh, just a, a Dutch idea. It's, it's not just taken over into Germany. So Living Knowledge, the network of sign shops, um, has about 100 members in almost 30 countries. Um, following the general idea of sign shop, generating research ideas, participation in um, advising or performing research in data collection in co-creation of knowledge and definitely promoting an open dialogue and debate between science civil society and other stakeholders relevant for any research process there was a growing request in um, sign shops and sign shop activities one project was mentioned terraris public engagement in research um, and we were able to give support. There, the development of sign shop, the establishment of uh, sign shops in Europe or beyond happened in many waves. The first wave started in the Netherlands in the 70s in community-based research here in, um, in uh, Northern America. Just to give you an idea why, where the name came from, why, why is it called a sign shop? It was a group of um, students and researchers at Utrecht University in the Netherlands, um, and they convinced, uh, persuaded the university to support this new idea of linking civil society needs to research. And the university said, yes, that's a good idea, 
Um, where do you want to do that? The only place we can give you is not within any faculty building, but we have this old shop here. And so they thought, so we're doing science, and we're, we're placed in a shop, so why not call ourselves a science shop? And <laughs> this term, Wittenskapswinkel, uh, was, was taken into almost every language. Boutique de science in French, in Wissenschaftsladen in German. Yeah, so we took it as a brand name. Uh, although it's it's hard to explain, yeah, but it, you know it, it says or, or explains or shows the openness of this concept. Like a shop, you can get in and you get something. And here, in this case, you don't even have to pay for it. So when talking about the different waves, um, some some of them are listed there: second wave, third wave, fourth wave. Um, many support coming from existing sh sign shops. Um, uh, and in the end, it led to a quite interesting landscape. So these are not all of the sign shops which are now active, uh, but at least um, a good overview of samples where they are. I'm really proud of this one. Where are we? Over there in White Russia, they are going to establish a sign shop. So we are going beyond the inner bound, uh, boundaries of, of Europe. Um, the, the, the idea of Science Shop is still moving forward. Um, lately, two European projects are funded, just to give you an idea where in other parts of the world you can find uh, similar initiatives, mainly based on um, activities by, by one of the partners. For example, the French-speaking speaking African countries are supported by uh, a Canadian, Canadian sign shop. Um, the, the, the sign shop in Haiti, uh, it belongs to this network as well. What, what's not on there is the, um, the activity now um, started by two European funded projects which aim at establishing new sign shops in various contexts to demonstrate that uh, the benefits uh, of starting these connecting activities in various uh, kinds of organizations. So they also discuss the opportunity of having a sign shop in a company setting, which of course would lead to a couple of discussions, especially when you have this aspect of non-for-profit uh, on your mind. But we will see. Um, we are really interested in, um, in what, what will come out of these projects. There will be more partners, more people to discuss with, and more people to forward the idea of linking sign shops on uh, civil society needs with, um, with, with uh, research resources. And this goes hand in hand with a, with a remarkable interest in higher education institutes to move forward. So it's not just community driven, these kind of activities. There's a huge interest in, in higher education institutes as well. Um, and again, we are talking about sign shops, but it's not just sign shops. It's, it's the way how to interact with community and community needs. And I don't care how it's called, as long as it's done. <laughs> um, one risk, of course, and when we get a bit into challenges, uh, one risk is, of course, when it becomes so popular uh, and it stands for a certain quality, how can we guarantee this quality? Does the term sign shop just become um, a lip service, yes, just you know, for oh, we're doing a sign shop, yeah, that, instead of really uh, following the uh, initially mentioned criteria. So we will have an eye on it. We cannot control it, but we at least can discuss it uh, that it is performed in a way that it's for the benefit of civil society. Just a short overview how many projects uh, the sign shops were involved in. It's not about one sign shop here. It's about the living knowledge network and sign shops which are uh, involved in these kind of projects. And these are the two I just mentioned, Inspires setting up sign shops in the health environment and Sign Shop EU exploring uh, the, the opportunities and, and um, possibilities by running a sign shop in different environments in different organizational uh, backups. 
When we talk about challenges, um, besides that lip service, um, bottlenecks and problems are the same as you might have in other participatory activities. It's the time constraint researchers have. Is there enough time to do that? It's the pressure to, uh, to publish. Um, universities are interested in big projects. Yeah, instead of these small, uh, small scale projects. Um, so they're more ex interested in external funding or uh, in cooperation with companies and governmental institutions. And of course, when the political climate changes, when um, um, the, the pressure on students to, to run through their uh, education gets higher, um, then of course, um, the work of sign shop is definitely under pressure. And of course, there are other issues, the lack of embedding, uh, so that engaged courses always rely or almost off, uh, almost always rely on engaged um, teachers. And uh, this means on a relatively small number of academic staff. So when these people leave, uh, the engagement activities might die out. So this is. Um, Universities, of course, face comp uh, competing demands, um, education, income generation, recruiting and retaining students. So there are a couple of issues affecting um, the work of, of sign shops. And of course, recognition is one thing. We already had the possibility to discuss some of these, these aspects uh, during these days. Um, it's publish or perish. Yeah, so how is the, the work, the engaged work of researchers recognized in the academic environment and how is it recognized in uh, society? So it needs rewards um, and uh, value systems. But um, science shops do have impact. They create impact. Um, Besides the fact that universities, in my understanding, have the obligation to um, contribute their varied expertise or expertise uh, to society, um, they definitely can rely or build on or refer to um, the impacts that are um, described here for students. Um, Students, by working in sign shop projects, develop social competences. They work on real life pro um, projects, they get real life experiences, they improve their communication and cooperation skills with people from non-academic environments. They um, get new knowledges or new knowledge. Uh, they get different perspectives on an issue, on a problem. Um, Transdisciplinary research is one of the one of the key words. They they gain knowledge and expertise in this field, and they get skills to connect and bring together various needs and demands of different groups. These are um, employment fostering skills. So it's not just about gaining knowledge. It's also um, you know training skills, which makes them more employable. But also researchers benefit from sign shop work. They get access to case materials. Um, they have possibility for direct publication, but probably not in these uh, high ranked journals, but there's a, there's a possibility to make uh, their findings, their research activity available. Uh, they get opportunities for networking, probably with groups they haven't worked before. They get access to networks in civil society. And of course, if a, if a teacher, if a professor supervises a student, um, it can be seen as part of the teaching obligation uh, a professor might have. So it, it fits. And of course, sign shop function as an antenna or even as an incubator for re new research themes. So this um, might lead to a new, completely new focus of the research agenda of an institute or a faculty. An example here again, several small questions on medicine use in the tropics were addressed to the sign shop in Groningen, which of course is one, one of the big ones. Um, after these 
several small questions. Uh, two larger PhD projects were coordinated and they led to publications which are now standards um, um, in the bookshop of the Royal Dutch Topical Institute. Yeah, so even these new research fields coming up by this. In Denmark, on the other hand, for example, requests from farmers led to the development of uh, organic food as a research and teaching area at the Danish Technical University. So requests can create new research fields and new research uh, themes. And of course, if you see university on, on a broader level, there's um, media attention, public attention for the work of the university. Um, there's um, the possibility to, to modernize uh, teaching courses, teaching curricula. It contributes to science communication and outreach, the third mission of universities. Yeah, maybe I just give you some, some examples where all these different impacts are reported, uh, short-term impacts, long-term impacts, where you can get uh, information about different um, tools and methods used in various contexts of um, public engagement and engagement uh, with community uh, groups. The RRI Tools Project, I really can recommend. It, it provides a huge database of projects and um, tools to run a responsible, responsible research and innovation activity. Enrich, definitely to be mentioned because Enrich gives examples how responsible research and innovation can be embedded into existing teaching courses. Yeah, so there, there are examples, um, best, best practice case studies uh, for, for architecture, for archaeology, for different kind of, of teaching courses where these student learning activities on societal needs were embedded. Scientists is more is, is about science education. Engage 2020, we mentioned it, uh, they develop an action catalog with a lot of elements uh, and, and participatory methodologies uh, to choose from in, a, in, in the specific context you might be working in. These projects are still running, Inspires, Science Shops, and uh, on, on the top right, Entrance. Entrance is a follow-up project of what I just described for Enrich, for teaching courses in higher education institutes. I think the, the presentation will be provided, so these are the, 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 the links. Uh, I really recommend to have a look at them to learn from the experiences we made in, um, in our sign shop working environment. Okay, let's, let's come to an end. When I look in, into Europe uh, and uh, European activities, uh, there have been significant investments in developing a strategy for a more responsible research and innovation. Um, and evaluations of these activities definitely call for a greater involvement of society uh, and citizens in research. Unfortunately, Europe is discussing the new research framework program and at this stage of the discussion, there's no longer a science within for society funding scheme. Uh, so we will have to um, still work on our MEPs, on our members of the European Parliament, that they uh, raise their voice that this activity is further needed. Yes, because what, what is good about... I'm sorry. <laughs> so. What is, what is good about a research? Shall I switch off the small microphone? No, it's okay. Uh, if, if it's only advancing science and doesn't have impact on society. When we talk about community engagement, community engagement is not something you do and then you get, get done with it. It's a strategy. It's about partnerships. It's about partnerships and not about projects. It's also about honoring the work of communities. It's about co-creation, co-development, and co-production. And Peter Levesque from the Institute for Mo Knowledge Mobilization, basically his grandmother, 
uh, once said, listen twice as much as you speak. This is why you have two ears and only one mouth. It's great <laughs> because listening skills are very important when you work with communities. Um, it's listening to the subtext. It's reading between the lines. It's to find the problem behind the question or the question behind the problem. <laughs> it depends on the per perspective from which side you look at it. It um, allows to better understand uh, what are mutual benefits in, in a cooperation. Um, there's one problem, of course, you face when, when, when you dis discuss with, with um, community groups, with civil society groups. They often have the feeling that their question is not important enough. Yeah? On the other hand, um, do you think sci scientists trust society? Do you think that all scientists believe in what society requests from them? Um, they think that citizens' problems are not relevant for research. So there's a lot to do in this, in this field of interaction. It needs, to bridge, it needs to bridge the gap between the feeling of inferiority and ignorance. I think this is a very important thing because when you work in this interface, you sometimes might have the feeling you're working, you're working in a field of landmines. One wrong step, yeah, one wrong word, and this blows up your initiative, and uh, this might make you give up. But this, this is, this is yeah, you might feel like this, but may, maybe you better see it as a, as a computer game. Um, so you walk through the level, you fail, you start again, you have to learn something on your first steps, you get a bit further, you might fail again, but at a certain point you reach the next level. So I think we're all Super Marios in this field when we work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In the end, science shop work is not a box ticking exercise. Yeah? It's about interaction between citizens and diverse other stakeholders. Um, it's about you know, working together with stakeholder groups, with knowledge-based institutions, with universities, with private and public research institutions. When, when we work in this field, and when I look back into to the years we are working now uh, as a science shop, we were always confronted with new topics and new challenges. And of course, we're going through some of them these days, post-truth, fear of future technologies, and the idea of sustainable development goals is coming up, and we have to rearrange our research activities. Uh, there are new occupational fields, so they new, need new skills. How can we students prepared for, be prepared for new occupations? So um, this also means that our methodologies of engagement have to be changed, have to be adopted to the new challenges, to the new needs we are running through. But in all of these fields, society's participation is an important factor. And when you think of the university system, <laughs> I know that the academic system is like a container ship on the ocean. It takes time and efforts to effectively to change the course. Um, but I know there are already good guys on the bridge. And in case we have the speedboats and the tugboats, work on smaller issues before this big thing changes. But if you don't like the picture of the container ship, probably you like this one more. <laughs> so what can higher education institutes contribute? Uh, and in my opinion, it's not an if, it's an how. High EIs, high education institutes can provide resources. They should, they must acknowledge engagement. They should, must uh, support publication. Existing curricula have to be checked and updated to new needs. Uh, so societal engagement must be an element in teaching. Um, new curricula and studies are on the way and they have to be embedded. Structures, as they exist for technology transfer, for example, can be adopted to societal transfer. And, of course, 
boards of universities should be open for civil society organizations so that they have a talk, that they have a voice in the development of um, the university as a, as a, a, a structure for development uh, for the future. Um, so they should take, have a voice in this. So it's not about giving a destination, it's giving a sense of direction and just to say, research and science mustn't be an alien element in society, from my perspective, being outside of the academic system. So co-creation is a chance here. Um, it's a chance to break with old habits. It's not the easiest way, but I think it's, pro it's a promising way. And at this point, thank you very much for your attention. I think um, communication skills are, are extremely important. Um, the possibility to talk to people in their different languages. And to communication, listening is an, uh, is, is an element. Um, experience uh, and practice shows once you have convinced a, a researcher to become a supervisor of a student project, um, he comes back or she comes back. Yeah, because they're so excited about the learning they have themselves in, in working with a community group is that they say, okay, don't come every semester, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to contribute again. And, and so this is, you know, what, what, what we call Clinton pushing. You have to go from door to door. You have to talk to the people. It takes, needs time. It needs to be somehow the, the elephant with a thick skin uh, and don't give up. Yeah, but it's mainly about communication. And of course, if, when, when you're working in a um, uh, university environment, you definitely should know about the structure of, of the university. You should know, is it better to address a researcher, or is it better to address a board, or a dean, or even go to, to, to the um, president of the university? You might have a look at um, university statutes to see what, what has the university already written as commitment to engagement in, into their statutes. Um, is there, um, what, what are um, teaching courses? You can check uh, the curricula or the teaching courses in, in the semester overview and see, okay, this, this is something which might fit into this, into this seminar or into this, into this lecture. Uh, and of course, this needs a bit of knowledge what is happening in the university. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, not really sure if it's social sciences that is really needed because you find these have a website where people can just put their question there. Um, you, you can use um, events if you run, um, for example, a, a science cafe or any kind of outreach event. Just mention the opportunity that people can come with their questions. One thing about this, it, the, these questions should not be anonymous. Yeah? People must be aware, at least an email in, so that the science shop staff can get into contact uh, with, with these people forward would go for, move forward in the process you know what what is what is the real problem behind the question asked is there already something to, to you know to explore what's definitely behind but in fact you can use anything you want um, uh, and maybe it makes sense to link it to specific activities you already run so if you have a science festival um, which is under preparation it might be possible to have a Booth, booth, uh, sorry, <laughs> a booth <laughs> in um, some somewhere during during these activities.
just to ask for um, your needs. Yeah, what, what do you need from universities?